Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to the post-image cluster. Um, for those who don't know <laughs> what this is, which is not many people here, but um, basically it's a research cluster that exists under Meteor Institute uh, for Arts, Culture and Technology. And we're very happy tonight to have David K. Ross um, talk about an exhibition about surveying. Um, and this talk is going to be recorded for the Post-Image Clusters archive and will be available for all of you to listen via our Mixcloud account. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to present David K. Ross. Uh, David's investigation with photography, film, and installation examines the performative cap capacities of unchoreographed and unscripted activities, along with the relationships that exist between the recorded events and the representations in physical space. These interests have been applied to various proje projects, including a close examinations of color-coded art shipping crates, the enigmatic activities of student land surveyors, the va vapor dispersed from art museums, HVAC units, um, the mythic and sublime qualities of urban lighting fixtures, and the quietude of artists' storage spaces. Um, David's work uh, has sorry. David's work has been uh, exhibited in uh, major institutions in North America and Europe, and are included in private and public collections, including the National Gallery of Canada, the Musée d'Art Contemporain de Montréal, and the Canadian Centre for Architecture. Uh, his films and video installation have been featured in Cinema Marfa in 2012, Le Mode de la Photo à Montréal in 2013 the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts in 2014, and the Toronto International Film Festival Wavelength Program in 2015. A survey of recent work positions was exhibited at Desibao Gallery in Montreal in the fall of 2015, and David's show, The Traces of Lost Facts, the subject of this evening's presentation, uh, was presented at Rice Media Center at Rice University in Texas in 2016. Upcoming, he'll be, sorry, upcoming he'll be exhibiting work in an exhibition to be held this summer at the MAC, uh, yes, uh, whose subject is the cinematic and architectural legacies of Expo 67. Uh, so please join me in welcoming David K. Ross. Thank you for that introduction. You're <laughs> um, so, uh, can we turn those lights down a little bit? Okay. Yeah, let's just turn them off for now. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks uh, for the introduction, and thanks for the invitation too. It's uh, nice to be here, and to have the opportunity to talk about uh, this project. Uh, so, uh, this evening I'm, I'm going to talk um, about, um, pr principally about the work that came out of a film that I made that was finished in 2015 called uh, Theodolytic. And uh, uh, in order to do that, I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm actually going to um, offer a sort of crash course in surveying for everyone, because this the topic of the film is surveying, but it'll also end up being a kind of um, it'll also end up being a kind of crash course in filmmaking and a crash course in um, exhibition making and bookmaking too, maybe. Um, and the, uh, the sort of mode that I hope to uh, uh, present all the information for the talk in is uh, maybe best um, uh, projected through this. This, uh, this image, which is, was taken by uh, uh, Philippe Leanel, who was uh, running the camera for me on one of my shoots. He snapped it uh, while the lens was off a 35 millimeter RE camera. And the, the trees that you see on the mirror are actually behind the camera. And you can, so what you're seeing is the, what you would, uh, what you're seeing is through the, the eyepiece of the camera, essentially. Um, I think it's a nice uh, kind of metaphor for the talk that kind of that the hope is to fold the ways and means of filmmaking uh, and map making back on themselves. So, uh, because the the talk 
uh, and by extension, the, the exhibition and the book that I worked on were all about a particular film called Theodolitic. I thought it would uh, behoove me to show the film so that you would know what I was talking about. So I'm going to start off by showing that. It's about uh, the 14 minutes long, um, and it's, uh, it's in color, <laughs> uh, and uh, I'll just play it. So, um, that was the film. Um, I had a show here at uh, Dazabao last year, and as a result of that exhibition, I was, I was asked to, um, to exhibit some work at the, um, at the uh, Media Center uh, in, uh, in Houston, in Texas. And um, I didn't really know much about the gallery, so I asked them to send me some plans to see see what I was uh, getting myself into. And uh, so they sent me this this um, plan that didn't have any annotations on it, but uh, the building itself where um, where the exhibition was going to be is actually um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a dedicated building uh, on the campus of the university there that is uh, given over exclusively to the study of theater and photography. So or sorry, not theater, uh, cinema and photography. So the building is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a manifestation of, of what it's, uh, the kind of production model, I guess you could say. At, at one end is the theater where films are shown, and then uh, as you progress through the building, you, you move through a gallery space, and um, at the back of the building are a bunch of classrooms where they, they have uh, wet labs for uh, film developing and uh, all the facilities for um, film post-production. Um, as you can see, it's kind of a, it's a bit of an eccentric building. This area that's in gray that I've highlighted there are actually um, balconies. Uh, so there's, it's, uh, th these are the areas that represent the gallery space, but they're sort of surrounded by these uh, mezzanine levels that lead one up to extra uh, editing rooms or extra classrooms. Um, it's a. It's not what you would call a white box, white cube <laughs> space. Uh, there's big, big uh, windows there for uh, views out onto some green space, um, and it's obviously not a black box either. So, um, it was kind of a challenging space to deal with in terms of obviously I wasn't going to be doing any big installation projects there with film, and showing photography there seemed a bit. Uh, uh, questionable, given its kind of public status as a kind of three-way space to um, to classrooms in the cinema. Um, so I thought that seeing as the 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 building and the space itself was given over to uh, the study of film and photography and and production and history and all of the um, of the itinerant studies that go, that go along with those, that maybe what I would do is. Uh, put together an exhibition that that uh, that kind of peeled apart the making of the autolytic um, because as part of this exhibition they uh, also planned a screening of a lot of my f recent films and the autolytic was one of them so I thought that would be um, make for an interesting uh, um, approach to the exhibition um, so uh, not really uh, not being too sure about how the space was configured, I, I called ahead and asked them to send me some some um, some numbers and uh, to um, let's see if I can get this and um, went ahead and made a, a model of the space. So the idea was to install four surveyors uh, tools around the the gallery, with which you would then use to um, view up close the materials that I. Um, that I accumulated over the making and uh, researching of the f of the film Theodolitic. So the idea was that on certain walls there would be production images like you see here. I made these kind of moments pause for a long time so that the people in Texas could read, have time to read them. Uh, so that was the first um, uh, 
surveying tool. The second one, when you look through it, um, you would have a you would be given a close up view of uh, outtakes that were generated over the course of making the film. So this would be like an iPad or small monitor, and you would be able to listen to that through um, wireless headphones. The third uh, surveyor's tool, again, you would have access to uh, more production images. Um, I ended up reordering these in a way that made more sense once I, once I worked more in the exhibition. And then the, the fourth one, again, here it shows production images, but in the installation I actually ended up using um, more historic images here. Uh, and then, I'm actually just going to speed this up a bit so you don't have to. There was some text on the wall, and which I'll get to later. So, and uh, this just shows the location of the four um, um, surveyors' tools. They're actually surveyors' level surveyors' levels, so uh, you can use them for uh, determining how level something is over a, a great span of space. Uh, that's one sitting there. It's like a, it's like more like a, a telescope. Okay. So um, then you would see the pictures in detail. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so my my plan was that um, regardless of where the level was located um, and where how far wall, away the wall was, you would the the image that filled the the viewfinder would always perfectly fit top to bottom. So. Um, that meant that because not all the walls were the same distance from the viewers, that very precise measurements had to be made ahead of time because it meant that some, some um, images that were closer could be smaller and some images that were further away could be larger. So um, I worked with uh, Stephen Sherman here um, uh, over a couple of days at Concordia and we, uh, we kind of set up a virtual version of the space and moved the, the device back and forth to figure out how big the images should be. And then I laid it all out in plans, et cetera. And um, so there's a detail showing how they would they looked on the wall in the space. And uh, just to give you an idea of the, the effect, I just used my cell phone to, um, to, f to film this. But <laughs> it was a little tricky. <laughs> <clears throat> It was most tricky because with one hand I was holding the phone and then with the other I was trying to manipulate the focus and the, the rotation um, of the device itself. So but it gives you an idea. So these were all images from uh, old uh, Theodo Light uh, instruction manuals basically. Yeah, Along they could, the yeah, exactly, yep. So you sort of had to sort of figure out how the thing worked itself a little bit and then move it around. So this uh, installation view, you can see how high up on the right there's uh, one of the levels sitting on a little podium. They were all set at basically at eye level when you were standing up there. So um, the what ended up happening was that the images formed a kind of freeze around, along the top of the gallery space, and it left the, essentially left the gallery walls at their, where normally artwork would be hung completely open. So it was a kind of um, investigation into uh, how it is that space is made in, inside the gallery as well. Um, a lot of that was also helped along by the fact that um, because there was a direct relationship between the distance of the, of the, the optics, the viewer, uh, the optics and the image on the wall, they acted as a kind of uh, a marker for how far apart they were. So um, the smaller an image was, the, the, closer, uh, the closer it was to the viewer on the wall. So there's just another shot. Uh, as well in the exhibition, I had a, um, I had a kind of a, an audio portion or an audio section set up so that you could um, watch the whole f film all the way through, but it's a little bit blurry there, maybe because I don't have my glasses on, but I, I, uh, 
I made a version of the film that had time code embedded in it. And uh, on the podium, there's a sheet that had um, Doug Moffat's notes about uh, particular moments in the film and his kind of thinking for his approach to the sound design at any given time. So it's kind of, it was a little bit like, um, almost like subtitles that you could kind of read along and, and uh, see what he was thinking about at a certain point in the film. There was also the opportunity to, um, this is uh, just a really short clip, but uh, a lot of the sound was, well, almost all the sound for the film was kind of built by Doug by hand, but as part of that, we had a, we had a session of Foley here at Concordia across the hall where we, um, I gathered together a whole bunch of tools and went in the sound studio and, and was banging on stakes and had a tape measure. So this is a kind of rough edit of what that sounded like. So, yeah, that was just me moving a tape measure around in a room. <laughs> so there's another installation view. There's Rebecca demonstrating one of the devices. Uh, on her right is a book you can see on a, t on a table there. Um, so I, I realized as I was working on this exhibition that uh, my, my original idea was that on the walls I would also include um, a lot of the written material or some of the textual documentation that went into the research and making of the film. But um, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it would just be kind of a, a pain to have to read text through one of these things. <laughs> they're designed for reading numbers off, a, really big numbers off a large ruler, but uh, more than that. And they're good for images, but not much more than that. So I, I decided at that point to um, put together a publication that would, that would kind of function as somewhere between a confessional, um, a user's manual, and a file, a file folder, and maybe a reference guide for um, not only the, 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 the exhibition, but the, f the film itself. It, in, a, in a way, it became a kind of um, how to make a film guide, really. So I, uh, I, had a, I had a big stack of sketchbooks that I'd kept um, over the course of the production because from start to finish the film took me almost five years so it went through a lot of iterations and changes and I had a lot of um, uh, material from that so a lot of those things were scanned and went into the book that's the cover for it and uh, <clears throat> the chat the way the catalog slash um, guide was uh, structured was using um, uh, uh, section well, they were, it was all split into sections, and they all corresponded to definitions of key surveying concepts or ideas. So one of them was the prologue, which I'll read. It's kind of hard to see there. The prologue and the epilogue are the only things that were not uh, uh, those are not surveying terms, but <laughs> so I'll just read it. Um, land surveyors are honored. With a, with a more sorry, it's a bit dark. With a more earnest attention than falls to the lot of any other philosopher, the fields of arithmetic, theoretical geometry, astronomy, and music are discoursed upon to listless audiences. I hope that's none of you. Uh, sometimes to empty benches, but land surveyors are like judges. The deserted fields become their courts, crowded with eager spectators. You would fancy them mad when you see them walking along the most devious paths, but in truth. They are seeking the traces of lost facts in rough woods and thickets. They walk not as other walk. Their path is the book from which they read. They show what they are saying. They prove what they have learned. By their steps, they divide the rights of hostile claimants. And like a mighty river, the surveyor takes away the fields from one side and bestows them to another. Uh, that's a quite a, an amazing observation of um, the art of surveying and um, all the more so because it was written in the year 540 by uh, someone named Cassiodorus, who was the secretary to the king of the Ostrogoths. Um, it was his job to essentially just kind of like act as a 
as a human recorder for all the activities, and one of his jobs was to describe surveying to the king. And so that was his, that was his description. And uh, just because I'm going to go really out of order, now I'm going to read the epilogue. <laughs> So it's, if you want to just skip the rest of the talk, you can leave after this and get the idea. <laughs> so the epilogue is uh, not a literary term, it's a film term. It's usually the bit that comes at the end of the film to sew everything up, so, but um, I thought I would use it here. Um, hopefully I can see this, it's kind of dark. This is a little bit longer, so. <clears throat> In 2011, I started a film I was calling Les Apentures, or The Surveyors. Five years later, I finished the project. By that time, its title had changed, and so had I. The Autolytic was ostensibly my first attempt at filmmaking, although it took me so long to finish that three other projects were completed in the interim. The film was an enormous challenge. In fact, that was part of, the pre that was part of its premise. The student surveyors <coughs> enrolled in a community college course were learning how to survey, and the self-top filmmaker, me, was learning how to film. We were in sync with each other, but what I didn't expect was for multiple classes to graduate long before I would. <clears throat> the way in for Theodolytic eluded me, often to the point of despair, at times bringing me close to considering its abandonment. Occasionally, not knowing how to complete the project reduced me to tears. I struggled with how to finance it, how and where to shoot it, how to edit it, how to think about it, and how to contextualize it. Breakthrough ideas, new methods of shooting, and invented systems sometimes led to exciting discoveries, but more frequently, they simply ended in disappointment and dead ends. One long surveyor step forward, two back. I learned that with experimental filmmaking, the experimenting is not just limited to aesthetics or technique. The speculative infuses everything. It requires experimental equipment borrowing, experimental patience testing with my collaborators, experimental scheduling, experimental budgeting, and experimental forces of will and determination. I also learned that working on a project when it is not going well can be excruciating. Effort offers no assurance of exactitude. And when we watch a, a finished film, we see it from the safe harbor of its own culmination, residing permanently in the temporal zone of after afterness. A finished film will always be finished, but without the comfort of prescience, I often thought the autolytic might never be worthy of exposure to the world. Bringing a project to completion is frequently not exciting, not creative, not exotic. It's just hard. Werner Herzog said that making films is like having a child, that they require attention, nurturing, and protection. I think this is true, but what I did not know was that I needed this kind of care too, which thankfully came in the guise of countless people who were willing to, to let me make countless mistakes. They were okay with letting me fail better. This publication offers some of the traces of those trials, missteps, and successes. <clears throat> so um, I thought what I would do for this talk, is, so basically now the talk is starting, <laughs> uh, talk about a preamble, um, is I, I would use um, some of these key points from the book, not all of them because the book is about 200 pages long, and uh, just kind of walk you through uh, the materials that were generated both by the exhibition and by the film and, and uh, by the making of the book itself. So uh, good place to start. Point of beginning, the starting point of the survey. So this film, this uh, project started um, here in St. Henry in Montreal. And it was the um, kind of the product of a coincidence of, of location, really. This is where, uh, where we were living at, at the time in uh, 2010. <clears throat> and not far away, a couple of blocks away, um, was the site of the Ecole de Métier where uh, surveying was taught almost every day of the year, except for t they, they only actually take a week off at Christmas and they also take the uh, construction holiday. Good training, I suppose. <clears throat> So the students um, 
the students at this school, which is actually an old high school, um, use, um, use the streets and alleys around the school to, to, uh, to practice their skills. And um, so as a result of that, if you happen to be in that neighborhood on any given day of the year, you're likely to see this uh, kind of scenario. Um, people in small groups out on sidewalks um, practicing basically, taking sometimes taking exams or just uh, t um, in, um, working out assignments. Uh, they do it in spring, summer, winter, and fall, so it happens year round. Um, and they also do it, um, they also do most of their exams on the school property, which, um, which is where I shot the film. Uh, one of the areas of the school is, uh, is actually used as a soccer field, and the other one is a converted uh, racetrack. So, yeah. So, uh, when I was thinking about this project, I would just sort of, as I would see them, I would take out my phone or a camera that I have with me and just take very sort of informal snapshots of people because I thought that what they were doing was interesting, but I didn't really have a kind of um, idea about how the project was going to be configured really at that point. So the next surveying term, foresight. Foresight is a reading taken on a position of unknown coordinates since a survey progresses from a point of unknown position to points of, of known position to unknown position. A foresight is a reading looking forward along the line of progress. So for me, that, that, uh, the foresight takes the form, as it does for many of us, of applying for grants, looking to the future with hope. Uh, <clears throat> uh, over the course of the some four and a half, five years of working on this project, I wrote four grants, uh, absolutely none of which were successful. <laughs> so I got, I got good at writing about this project and thinking about it. And um, in a way, I'm kind of grateful for the opportunity because it forced me at least once every uh, eight months or so to, to work out what it was that I, was, that I thought I was trying to do anyway. Uh, so this is, a, this is the, a draft of the project description, which again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this particular act of uh, writing. Um, so this is the third, um, the third one I wrote, this is the project description short experimental film that uses the documentation, the documentation of cartographic training exercises as a lens through which to examine the practice of cinematographic representation. How do we teach ourselves to see place? How is abstract space delineated, measured, made comprehensible, and given meaning through documentary processes? What physical, social, and political powers are yielded when space and place are inscribed within cartographic documents and cinematographic images? How is space apportioned? and adjudicated. Uh, one of the other things I did while I was working on the project was apply to uh, a program that Maine Film has, which is uh, it's called like their Film Factory. And uh, they would provide you with a, a serious discount on the use of their equipment and give you whatever uh, training it was that you thought you might um, need. Uh, for me, this was critical because I'd actually never made a film before, so um, um, I can't quite read this, but part of the proposal that I, um, that I submitted to them was that, um, in my mind, the way, uh, the way I saw it was that making a film about these student land surveyors was a perfect project for me because as they were learning to, make, uh, to become surveyors, I was going to learn to become a filmmaker. And even more critically, if I screwed up, which I thought I would, I would always be guaranteed that they would be there the next day to go in and film again. It also meant I didn't have to hire actors, of course. <laughs> so part of the process of putting things together and trying to think about the project, uh, um, I rented a 5D and went out and made some footage one extremely cold day. I, was, I think it was like minus 30 the day I shot this footage. So um, the thing that I, I realized when I was making that 
I mean, it went on longer than that, but um, the kind of the theme of the mise on the beam is a, is a big part of this project. Uh, I realized that I was out there with a tripod um, looking at all of these people who were looking at me with their tripods. Um, it made for some kind of interesting moments, which uh, went on to inform a lot of my thinking about the project. So next, next term, benchmarks. A benchmark is a permanent marker, usually a bronze disc at a point of determine, determined location. In a less formal sense, it is a point of fixed location, such as a mark on a bridge, abutment, or a foundation, or a rock face. So my reference points for this project ended up being quite uh, manifold, actually. Um, and um, they ended up uh, existing um, in kind of like a before and after sense in that the, um, as I was working on the project, I would go out and shoot film and it would make me think of something. And so I would go out and research it. And that thing that I did sort of posthumously became a reference point. But also um, I would have inklings about things and research them and then go out and try to sort of um, evoke them in, in, uh, filmic, in filmic ways. But one of the things that I, um, that I came across that I found was really interesting was this, the idea of the choreographic, which was a, a sort of an early enlightenment idea about how it is that we make space. Um, it's defined as, as you can see in the text, as a, as a predisciplinary, predisciplinary meaning, the pre meaning uh, pre, pre-geography or um, how we think about geography now, but a predisciplinary uh, tradition with firm roots in classical antiquity. Um, its name in Greek refers to basically Kora or, or place and writing. So um, I, I, I like the idea that there might be a sort of looser way of thinking about geography and how it, it was that a place could be um, um, recorded and, and written down. I also, I also really like the fact that it was, um, choreography is so related to choreography. And uh, one of the things I found much later on was um, the work of uh, Yvonne Rayner, who, um, amongst other things, made this amazing film about uh, a movie for hands, basically, where she just choreographed hand movements. Um, and uh, her, a, lot of, a lot of her early work from the 60s in, involved people just doing what we would sort of think of as being kind of like normal activities, of like walking or, or moving around a space in formation. And um, I think it, um, in the film, you see the lands, the surveying students in, in acting these, uh, it, it's actually an exam, uh, but in the enacting of the exam, it, it takes on a kind of appearance of a, of a dance really, or something that's been cor chore choreographed. choreographed. Um, of course, I was looking at a lot of other film. This is a still from um, The Draftsman's Contract by Peter Greenaway. And uh, I started amassing, um, I, I say amassing, but I started putting together a list of uh, films about surveying or surveying related. It turns out it's a pretty short list actually. Some of these, a lot of the, um, the films on this list are sort of only tangentially related, but the number of films that have been made about land surveyors is pretty short. <laughs> the Kurosawa at the top is probably the, is probably the one that sort of fits most closely into that category. There's also a terrible one, the second one from the bottom, uh, called Surveyor by this guy named Scott Blake. I don't know who he is, but um, I haven't been able to find any other films by him since, <laughs> so I'm not too surprised. Um, yeah. Uh, and then um, the other... Yeah, he probably does, and I'm probably not on it. <laughs> uh, part of the other sort of like idea for benchmarks for me was actually getting access to the school where where the students were working, and um, uh, that I should kind of like start to make my own kind of study trips there. So um, I did took a lot of photographs when I was there. You can see how like a photo like this is very similar to the one that you see in the starting or the opening shot of the film. And um, I started thinking in terms of this, the equipment that the more I started learning about surveying, the more I realized that my initial sort of hunches about the relationship between filmmaking and map making became more and more actually explicit. Um, there, you can see in the middle shelf, those things with the short legs on them are actually tripods. Um, and they're, they're very similar to this thing in the film business called the hi-hat, which is like a, just like a, um, or um, these other things are just short uh, tripods that are often called baby legs. So. 
Um, the, the kind of post thing on the left is a registration tool that they use in the shop at the surveying school to calibrate the surveying tools. Um, and on the right, you can see um, there's also a camera sitting on a pole, and uh, I'll get to that in a minute, but that's, uh, that's also used for calibration of equipment. So there are a lot of these um, very physical um, uh, connections between the, the two practices, which I thought were quite interesting. Um, also at the school, there's a, the guy, Mario Badet, who's the sort of like, I guess you could call him the technician, but he's also the person that does, all the students have to be nice to because he controls all the equipment. Um, but he's, uh, he's quite a character, and he's been there for so long that, and technology changes so fast, it's, it's very analogous to the film, film world, that, um, that any time there's a major shift in technology in, in, um, in camera or in filmmaking, there's almost always a parallel one in the, in, the, in the surveying world, so that there was a big shift from analog to digital that happened in the, sort of in the 90s. Um, but because those changes happen so um, so quickly, and because you know like things get updated, he would always keep one version of of old technology. So he has this kind of little museum there, and this great graphic in the middle, which kind of implies that you can see right around the whole globe. It turns out that the school also has quite an amazing um, archive that teachers have been keeping of old, of uh, of surveyor students. Um, some photographs, um, class pictures, like this great Bristol board, one from the class of 77, 78. <clears throat> some of the people have fallen off. But um, most interesting for me was that um, uh, coming across this set of flat files in which were literally hundreds and hundreds of uh, drawings that were the result of exercises and exams that the students had given over the years at the school. Um, some of the, the school's been um, functioning as a, as a, as a surveying school f since, the, since the early 70s, so some of these go back 30 years. And it was at that point that uh, a light went off for me about how I might be able to um, work on this project. Um, and it was combined with one of the things that you have to do when you rent uh, camera equipment from a big film house like uh, Lickett Mills or Michel Trudel, uh, this pole like is the one you saw in the other shot. You stick your camera on that thing, your film camera, and directly behind me where I'm taking this picture is uh, one of these things. It's a um, like a registration board for um, principally for checking the, to make sure your lenses are all um, in focus that they that they say they focus at a, the distance that they, they that they say they will. <laughs> But there's also other things that you're obliged to do when you rent a quarter of a million dollars worth of film equipment from a film house. And one of those things is to test and make sure that the film goes through the camera uh, properly, properly registered. And the way you do that is you film, you film that sentry board um, at the end, and then you take the film and the camera and you rewind it uh, about 50 feet. And then you flip that board upside down and you film it again. So you basically do a double exposure, and if any of the lines are jumping, it means there's a problem with your camera because the registration isn't the same. And it was in doing those kind of tests that uh, I thought, well, it's interesting. Like, if you can do a double exposure, you always hear about double exposures. Like, why can't you do more than that? So I was thinking that, um, that it would make a, an interesting kind of filmic meta metaphor for the layers of, um, the layers of, of moment and and time that this surveyor students had been uh, measuring and remeasuring and remeasuring the space that maybe I could build up the same kind of visual palimpsest uh, through through film. So this was just one of the diagrams I worked out that basically I would I would pass one piece of film through a camera eight times and at the beginning of the sh shot I would have the the um, the lens cover off and then for a few minutes at the end I would I would also have it off and then rewind the film and then each time leave the lens cover off for longer and longer so that you would build up a kind of uh, um, layering of, of experience, filmic experience. So I, um, I got my hands on a 16 millimeter for projector and uh, went out and did some tests. Oops, sorry. I seem to have a knack for when I was starting this project of renting cameras on really cold days. <laughs> I stopped doing that after a while. There's a reason why the film business is really busy in the summer. Um, 
So one of the things I learned while I was do making these tests was that it's really hard to have proper registration with a camera. Um, you can see how the, these things that look like cricket bats, um, that's just because the camera got shifted while um, we were rewinding the film. So it looks like there's two there, but my hope was that everything would be in the same place and that um, the only thing that got layered up were the activities of the, of the surveying students. <clears throat> So this is like a minute long, basically. What was the tripod on? What kind of surface? Was it on snow or? Ice. Okay. Yeah. But uh, because this was a 16 millimeter camera, we had to like, like crank the film back, and it was really hard. Yeah. So of course the camera got bombed and whatever. So um, it was it was hard. Also, I didn't show it here, but the other problem we had was because it was so cold, my hands were too cold to tighten the tripod properly. And what I didn't realize was the camera was slowly dropping. <laughs> so you see the ground going higher and higher. And I was like, what the hell is going on in this shot? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I was, quite, I was quite taken by these results. I thought that they were kind of evocative and um, that it led me to believe that it would be worth maybe in investing um, in further exploration in, uh, in this project. So I think I wrote another grant. <laughs> um, and, um, and uh, oh, I should say too that the, uh, around this time, I also got support from the National Film Board. They have a, they have a program for independent filmmakers and um, they were quite helpful in um, in executing all this whole project by helping me with the post-production costs. So kudos to the NFB for that. Um, learning what I did about the problems with hand cranking the film back through a 60 millimeter projector and realizing that if I was only, if I was gonna be making a film that was uh, multiple exposure, comprised only of multiple exposures, because that was what I thought I was gonna do, it meant that I wasn't gonna use up very much film, in fact. So uh, I shifted the budget and um, decided to instead use a 35 millimeter projector, um, which had a basically a motor which reround precisely the film the exact right way, and it meant that I hopefully wouldn't have to worry about this kind of um, registration problems. So I went out and rented a big camera and put the crew together and uh, um, coordinated with the school and did a bunch of shooting around the um, school on one extremely hot day. <laughs> uh, this is one of the rushes from that that test. You might remember that um, at the very beginning of the, of the film Theodolite, there's a shot that looks a lot like this. In fact, it is, it, the camera was set up in the same place. Um, because I didn't totally trust what I was doing, when, before we started one of these multiple exposure shots, um, I shot off about two or three minutes of just static of each of the locations where we were in case I needed to use them in the future, and I was glad I did that because I ended up using it. Um, you didn't see any of these footage in the finished film, and that's because I didn't use it. <laughs> um, I ended. Up, I realized that once I had all of this footage of these um, multiple exposure shots, that um, they just didn't quite make sense to me in terms of how they were going to get edited together in terms of other shots, and I ended up abandoning all of them actually. Um, even though I thought they were interesting, they just they didn't work. There's. I am. I'm fond of saying that when you make a film, there's like. There's the film you want to make, uh, and then there's the film you make, and then there's the film that wants 
wants to make itself in the way that it wants to be made. And uh, that film didn't want these shots in it. So baseline is a line used for reference in a survey job. It is often a center line or a street line. A baseline is not necessarily straight. For example, the center line of a street or a pipeline will often curve. Importantly, the baseline can be precisely located, then used for referencing other measurements on the job site. Selection of a baseline is entirely arbitrary. However, judicious selection can make the rest of the job much easier. Uh, the, probably the best example of baselines is you'll see them on the concrete on this on the street. There's like they often will hammer a nail in and then spray paint an orange triangle around it. That's a baseline. Um, so for me, um, in this project, the baseline kind of uh, it involved uh, essentially uh, bringing myself up uh, up to speed on um, ideas about surveying and how it um, how it works. Um, I learned all kinds of amazing things, like the world is not a sphere. Um, it, it is, in fact, an oblate spheroid. Um, <laughs> and uh, that also that uh, GPS uh, systems were invented as early as 1964, even though um, they seem much more contemporary than that. Uh, one of the other benchmarks for me was, um, was this painting, actually, uh, Piero della Francesca's fly Flagellation of Christ from um, the middle of the 15th century. Um, Again, this is one of those sort of um, pre-references. Pre I, I didn't sort of start thinking about this painting until after I'd shot some footage, but um, it sort of pertains to um, uh, a, a lot of ideas around how it is that space is constructed and how it um, was thought about in the Renaissance. Um, uh, Panowski talks about how pers perspectival space is a kind of um, as a as a rendering of what he calls the psychophysiological space into mathematical space, and um, so for for uh, a good part of our understanding about how the, the perspective works is is that f um, for him that it's very analogous to actually how a camera operates that you it's done from one position and all um, information is kind of projected back into that. Um, and it wasn't until after I'd shot the footage that you see in the film that that the space that I was shooting in bore this a lot of very um, uncannily similar attributes to that painting. I didn't try to make the painting, but um, you know the white line on the ground, the kind of like flat surface that acts as almost as a stage, the distinct um, separation of um, activity in the, f um, the foreground and the background. Um, people often kind of standing around in this kind of contrapposto stance. Um, the sort of bits of green that you can see in the back of each, of each um, uh, image, the pilasters or the neoclassical references that, are, that appear on the building in the back, which is actually a church, and um, not least of which is, um, well, there's, uh, you can see in the painting on the, in the top right corner, there's some clouds in the sky. Those are, um, what are defined as um, altostratus lenticularis, which are um, named after lenses. Um, so it almost seemed like this, this painting was kind of meant to be uh, made into a film, maybe, I don't know. There's also this uh, amazing um, analysis of the painting, which uh, uh, there's this strange thing that happens where if you look at the shadows on the ground of the people in, in the foreground, the light is clearly coming from the left and hitting the robes you can see on the, gr the, sh the ground where the shadow is to the right of them. But um, for the, f the actual flagellation scene in the background, the light is coming from the other direction actually. So it seems to imply that there's a light source in the middle of the day in this enclosed space, which um, I always think has been quite actually a kind of like a model of how um, a soundstage would work. Uh, the other thing I did was investigate a lot of uh, did a lot of research at the CCA, um, and they have some amazing books on early books on on surveying. Um, I love how these kind of like title pages work. They, they're, they're like, this information is what usually goes on the back of a book, but at one point this was actually just all considered to be the title of a book. Um, um, so, this one was uh, the, both of these were written in the early, uh, sorry, the late 1600s. Um, a point is that which cannot be divided. 
Um, so they they were full of um, handy tips like that, as well as uh, the sort of mathematical formulas about how to um, divide up and measure land, um, and kind of like exercises really. Uh, the reason these books were published then is because the theodolite, the device that s sort of um, spurred on contemporary or modern surveying, was uh, was actually invented in the late 1600s when um, um, a guy named by the name of appropriately by the name of Samuel Diggs um, uh, just got the bright idea of attaching a telescope to um, a device that had been around for a long time previous to that uh, for uh, regis making kind of like geometrical divisions of land. So, and, uh, and it was at that point that surveying really kind of took off as a, as a profession. Um, so more research about early surveying techniques, um, determining the length of a rood or rod as it's called now, and people actually using their own feet to make the feet. I love that. <laughs> um, and uh, other illustrations f from that same book. Um, you can't really read it at the bottom, but basically um, the inscription is um, indicating like, you know, this is, this is how you're, you're supposed to do something. You can see the little um, puti, the little angels um, flying along the horizon. They have a string between them. That's actually a chain. And uh, the way surveyors would work is they would always work in teams, in pairs, and one person would operate the device at one side and then the person with the chain would walk out a certain distance and that would uh, demark a certain amount of space. They used chains because they weren't uh, susceptible to stretching and shrinking like rope or leather was, so as long as it wasn't too hot, cold or hot. Um, so that brings me to the chain bearer, an assistant to the surveyor. Uh, the chain carriers moved the surveying chain from one location to another under the direction of the surveyor. This was a position of great responsibility and the chain carriers took an oath uh, as sworn chain carriers that they would do their job properly. You can see how this would be popular because, uh, or important because if you were a chain carrier and you were kind of tired, you might've taken a few shortcuts or maybe didn't pull the chain tight enough. So it was quite important that that, um, that, that person did their job properly. Um, Robert Gibson noted in his uh, treatise of practical surveying that the success of a survey depended on the care and skill of the chain bearer, saying the inaccuracies of most surveys arise from bad chaining. <laughs> I, have, I have a, a technical question, maybe you, you come to that, but like, is land surveying doing both, like this can be, like if you have land which was never used, you uh -huh. can eventually put landmarks down, right? This uh -huh. every, and the other, things if something is already there, you measure something and you make a plan. Is surveying yep. doing both? Yep. Because mm -hmm. this sounds more like you have uh, land which was... Unmeasured yet. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so... I guess these days it's more common, the second part is already exactly. there, or eventually you want to build something and you want to figure out where the points are. Yeah. Uh, surveyors are often described as being the first, middle, and last people on a building site. Yeah, because they're, they're, they need to check they need to check what's there. They need to confirm what's being built as it's being put up. And then they have to confirm that something was put in the right place yeah, in, okay. at the end, so. And but that's yeah. really done? Like in yep. bigger construction that you check first and you check yep. last? Okay. Well, they want to check first to make sure that you're actually building on the right piece of land, uh, tech, legally. Because the, the, do the piece of land is big enough that yeah. you can build what you want to build. Exactly, yeah. The documents that they end up producing are, are essentially like two-dimensional uh, legal documents or deeds, really. Yeah. So these are some of my chain bearers, I suppose, people that help me on my project. <laughs> and there's a lot of chain bearing to do when you shoot a film, lots of boxes and things to move around. Turning point is a station, either temporary or permanent, that is used as a pivot between sequential instrument positions. Since a turning point is used to extend the primary survey, its elevation must be precisely recoverable. A spot on rough ground is unacceptable. A mark on pavement, a rock face, top, top of a fence, post, or a fire hydrant would be good. Surveyors will often carry stakes that can be driven into the ground to provide temporary uh, solid surface for a turning point. So uh, for me, my project, as I was reading in the um, epilogue, it, it went through uh, a lot of um, dark moments. Uh, one of them was after I realized that I wasn't going to be using any of the m multiple exposure footage and I suffered a kind of a crisis of confidence, not really knowing, knowing that I, I wanted to
to make this project, but really not really knowing what form it was going to take or how I was going to make it. And um, at uh, actually at Rebecca's advice, <laughs> um, I went to the school and borrowed uh, I borrowed one of their uh, theodolites, one of their devices, and just brought it home with me and just started playing around with it and um, um, just set it up on our our balcony at home to see just to see how it would work because I, I actually hadn't done that yet. I was always just observing how these things were being used, but hadn't used one myself. And uh, I just, one, one day I got the idea um, while I was looking, so this is the, um, the tower for the Atwater Market. I don't know if you know where that is, but um, they, that summer of 2013, they were, they were doing, doing some construction on it. And uh, it suddenly occurred to me, Oh, I wonder if I can look through this thing with my camera on my phone. So, uh, I did. So that was the kind of a eureka moment for me. I, it was when I when I did that, I realized that I kind of had a way back into the project that that I could like I could literally mesh the idea of what it meant to be looking through a surveying device and provide um, a kind of cinematic treatment of it as well. Um, so there was also this, um, as you can see at the beginning there, this um, there's this thing that happens when you're trying to set the camera. On this thing that it's really not meant to be to go on that that the uh, the circle or the the oculus um, kind of it, it makes it seem almost as if it's blinking at you that there's a kind of presence and then it goes away and it comes back again so that set me on an, another kind of long um, research trek which was um, I'd started the project on 35 millimeter and I had a bunch of film that was on 35 millimeter that I could footage that I could use so I thought well I need to figure out a way to use 35 millimeter to shoot through one of these devices so I took the one that I borrowed and went with Alexandre Rose who was helping me with the camera at that point and we went to the film house Michel Trudel and tried I think almost every lens they have <laughs> um, to try to figure out a way to look through this um, uh, through this device, including um, macro lenses, and also, um, and that didn't work, and wide-angle lenses, and sh sh um, um, portrait lenses, and even putting like really long telephoto lenses on the camera and moving the, the theodolite really far away, thinking that would work, and none of those things worked. Um, but um, one of the advantages to working to um, working on a project that takes four years is technology changes <laughs> while you're working on it. And so really the true turning point for me came this day, as you can see, I'm quite happy, was when I figured out that I could bolt uh, six, uh, 60 millimeters um, film lenses onto the front of a Blackmagic pocket cinema camera that I had and that all of the lens to, um, lens to um, film plane ratios and the, and the the all of the the um, the focal lengths of all of the lenses seemed to magically line up in a way that meant that I could actually use this camera in the project. So, in the film that you that we watched earlier, all of the footage where you can see the crosshairs was shot with uh, with, with a rig that looked just like this. So, um, uh, the other um, thing that. I learned while I was working on this was, again, a kind of like reverse uh, research thing was coming across the work of this person, um, Albrecht Maidenbauer, who was um, born in uh, 1834 in Germany. He, um, he was an architect, and uh, right after finishing architecture school, like many architects, he decided he didn't want to be an architect, <laughs> myself included. And um, instead, he got a job 
um, doing surveys, uh, which were becoming a, an increasingly um, common thing, in particularly in Europe and in Germany at that point, mostly due to the uh, kind of uh, interest uh, spread on by the Enlightenment in um, ancient structures. There was there was a thought um, connected to issues around um, ideas around um, the sublime that uh, that that the history could, um, if it was uh, rationalized in certain ways, that it could um, that it could unfold unknown um, treasures. And it was around the same time that, that modern archaeology was, was born as well. But in, on continental Europe, um, that, those kind of impulses uh, evidence themselves in a, in a rush to, um, to actually measure existing ancient buildings. So there were many companies that sort of flourished that specialized in, uh, in measuring things like churches. So this, um, this particular um, Mr. Uh, Maidenbauer, he, his job was uh, climbing up on churches and measuring them. And you can see at the top where there's an arrow there and some writing in 58, that, um, that indicates the spot where he fell while he was measuring. And he was in one of the windows at the t top of that peak, and instead of falling all the way to the ground, he landed in the kind of um, the V shape, um, like the crotch of the church there. He broke his leg, but he didn't die. Um, after that, he thought, I think there's got to be a better way to do this. <laughs> um, so um, he took the technology, the burgeoning technology at the time of um, photography, and bolted it onto the burgeoning uh, technology at the time of, of surveying and invented this thing, which was a photogrammetry the, uh, camera. It didn't look like this. This was one that was in, um, developed much later on. but. You can, you can kind of see just by looking at it that it has the features of a surveying device. It has a circle that allows it to swing around. Um, it has very precise controls. And um, it's basically a view camera with, um, with the ability to raise and lower the lens without tipping the camera back. So for those of you who are familiar with photography, you know if you tip the camera back, you'll get distortion in the thing you're looking at. But if you raise the lens, then you can uh, position the camera in such a, or the lens in such a way that you won't get any distortion in the vertical lines of a building. Uh, he also had this brilliant idea of basically uh, setting the camera up so that lines um, would be embedded into the into the negative, the glass negative, which um, like a kind of grid, so that it meant that um, in the future it would be easier to um, measure things um, uh, based on the uh, lines that are embedded in the image. Um, so this, this technology kind of became a, a kind of a, um, signpost for me. That, and it, um, it was evidenced also later on in the early 20th century where uh, people were putting four by five cameras and attaching them to surveying tools so that you could photograph the thing that you were surveying. Um, an idea is that part of the celestial sphere that is directly below the observer. For a transit of theodolite, this is the point directly below the vertical axis of the instrument. For me, the nadir for this project took on many forms, but this is probably one of them. Um, um, it's a parking ticket. I was lost, and I had to write people to try to get the parking ticket back. There were a bunch of other ones, but um, that was one of them. And then the zenith is that point of the celestial sphere that is, sphere that is directly overhead from this, the observer. For for a uh, transit or theodolite is the point directly above the vertical axis of the instrument. Uh, for me, the zenith of this project was um, certainly working with great people like um, like Doug, who was instrumental in um, helping me work through the kind of um, the conceptual ideas of the project, um, and uh, just generally speaking, all of the crew that I worked with that helped me Im immensely. One of the other zeniths was uh, having the film get into a film festival. So it's always nice to have your work um, get out there in the world. More help, and uh, yeah. So I think that'll that'll do it. I don't know how long I was talking, but I don't think it was three hours. <laughs> <laughs> so. Any questions? Question. I'll speak into the microphone. But it's it's. Uh, um, I'm just wondering. I know because I I also have a, a soft spot for map making. Mm -hmm. There's now these days from 
everywhere and all over Quebec, there are LIDAR datas, which are laser, kind of like measuring all the terrain. It's super precise. Uh -huh. And I'm just wondering if it's already getting close that this type of surveying is getting obsolete at one point. Um, I'm not. I'm not a professional surveyor, so I don't know what how precarious the the profession is. But I doubt it. Um, based based on the f a bunch of things, one of them is that um, uh, there always needs to be. Uh, there often needs to be a human involved in the process to make decisions about things. Um, if you think about the fact that, like, even Montreal is a great example because this, the, I mean, the city was laid out sometime in the late 1500s. And um, so if you imagine you're some monk who's, like, chopping down trees and measuring out a piece of land, and then some other monk 20 years later um, decides that he wants to own the property next to that so that, um, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, over like a course of 100 years, the property is al almost always expanded on something else and it's reliant on other things. And so now there's this situation where um, the technology is so precise that it's capable of, of measuring, like the tools that these, um, that surveyors use are accurate within two millimeters over, over a kilometer. So, um, so the degree of accuracy is extremely high, but the maps that have been made are extremely inaccurate compared to those things. So there always has to be a level, a level of judgment in things. Um, and um, also all of the, um, the GPS technology that's embedded in these things now doesn't work if there's a lot of tree cover or if there's a lot of buildings. So all of the surveying students are always taught all the analog methods, kind of like at school where people are taught how to film, uh, you know, develop film by hand in the event that their technology doesn't work, which is which is more often than probably you would think. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know, maybe maybe there'll be some perfect map of the world made at some point. But it sounds like a Borges story. It's so official. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, David, for the surveying lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really interesting for photographers just in terms of like how we look through things mm -hmm. and also having been confused for a surveyor so many times when I'm out there with my large format. Now I know what the person I'm confused with is doing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's also like it made me think so much about um, like your other work with the, the Ville Marie light mm -hmm. and putting the camera sort of in the position of this light. Mm -hmm. And because that these two works, the one that you showed today that I saw Dazzy Bao and that other piece of the, the, the works that I know about you, I kind of um, described you before as like the guy who shows us how to look through things uh -huh. or through to look through mechanisms uh -huh. so I was surprised to hear that this like eureka moment of putting the the film camera in the lens of the the surveying equipment mm -hmm. was so recent right yeah so how like how long has it been that you look through things or put things in a position or is this still is it really relatively quite new uh, that's a good question I mean, I think in some way or another, it's been one of the kind of currents in my work, but um, uh, why it took me so long to figure it out in the instance of this film, I don't know. I, I think a lot of it was that, um, um, you know, like, like I was saying that um, I, was, I was kind of learning filmmaking at the time while I was working on the project. So I was, I think I was sidetracked by a lot of a lot of the learning curve and that was involved in that. Mm -hmm. And I was, tr I was still trying to think like a photographer when I was starting the film, um, meaning that um, the guy who was a, the technician at Main Film, he always says, oh, you're one of those photographers who wants to make a film. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He goes, oh, you always do the same thing. And I said, what do you mean? Well, you always, take a, you always get a camera, you set up a tripod, and then you just let it run. You never move the camera, ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so... As it turns out, that's what I, the kind of film that I ended up making. There's lots of movement in the film, but the camera itself never moves. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe, uh, I mean, I think those those impulses about how it is that the that things get represented and seen is was there in earlier works, but um, I don't know. Yeah. 
Do you consider yourself a photographer then? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I kind of go back and forth. I think I, the two practices of filmmaking and, and, and photography are, co are constantly informing each other for me. Like I'm always learning something from working on w in one kind of way and folding it back into the other. And sometimes I, I, I have an idea for a project and, and I think it, star it starts out as a film project, but then I realize like, no, this is gonna be a photography project or vice versa, but. Yeah, Rebecca, any questions? Yeah. I actually have um, one comment and one question the comment is I'll answer the question for you <laughs> yeah I've seen I've seen Dave over what a decade uh, in in four separate projects m making technology do something that it wasn't meant to do so dark rooms there's a four by five camera that was in placed in completely dark storage rooms and allowed to have exposure times of up to, what, seven weeks for one of them. So it became an object that was stored that itself was seeing how other objects had a kind of secret life. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was lots of, lots of research and finagling to make, make that technology do something that it wasn't meant to do. Um, with Attaché, there was, a, a, again, four by five camera that was uh, combined with um, microscopic lenses in order to get very, very small parts of colored shipping crates. Uh, the, the film that you mentioned, Jessica, on um, uh, La Farre, where the camera was actually bolted on to the, to the searchlight that is on top of Place Ville Marie, and then this one. So, you know, I think for, from afar, that's one of the things that I think really does signify mm -hmm. <laughs> a certain type of practice that, and, and I, I guess I've always said that it's because you grew up on a farm and you just like jerry-rig stuff together and make it work and there's a little bit of farm boy in your filmmaking. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one uh, you know, comment ab about your practice that I think really distinguishes it in a very interesting way. The question that I have for you is uh, uh, hearing this talk, which is wonderful for me, it's the first time I've actually heard you talk about the project having lived through it, seen the film being made, and seen the exhibition, uh, and, and watching that book come into existence, is that um, the, the project, it, from the very beginning, it took on a kind of metaphorical or analogical aspect that, that filmmaking and surveying in these two practices uh, became linked in, in you learning how to make a film while the surveyors were learning how to survey. But what is really apparent is how metaphorical um, surveying became for you. Uh, so especially reading those surveying terms, when you, they're, they're literally a guide to surveying. But metaphorically, now it's gone into a whole arena that I didn't expect. It's not even just a metaphor for filmmaking. It actually feels like a metaphor for making art mm -hmm. and the struggles that are involved with that and the, the, the processual joy and angst. But then it almost becomes like a metaphor for how to live a life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so I'm wondering if you could Talk about how the fi these five years of making this film be took you took you to through this analogical metaphorical um, kind of trajectory that matured you as an as an artist and a person, not just a filmmaker. Hmm. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Well. I think I think um, one of the main things that I learned was um, was uh, like I was um, like I read in the, the the epilogue for the book that there was a lot of moments when I thought that this film was actually gonna get the better of me, and um, I think that um, I think the thing that I learned in making it was that there's there's always a way through something. It's, and even though I, I was often thinking that there wasn't, that I realized that if I just needed to kind of change how I was viewing something or how I was looking at it in order to, to try to see a way through it. Um, it doesn't really answer your question though, but um, I guess in terms of the, the sets of rules, I mean, I don't know, I never really thought of myself as a kind of a rural person, so um, maybe they're m more, we're, we're, uh, <laughs> I was just gonna say <laughs> that maybe now that I have them, I'll, they'll be more handy for me, I don't know. <laughs> um, I yeah. think you designed the rules, I mean, I was watching the film and the, 
Oh, no, please. I can't. They're all holding. <laughs> they were, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you have a very uh, hmm, obsessive organizational in your research as mm -hmm. well as your, um, your viewing, which is really, it, for me, it really came up in the, in the school itself with uh, all the, with the tools are aligned and uh, shifted. I saw it in your show as well. So I think even if you don't know it, subconsciously you do have, I think you have that set of closure that is, is something that perhaps helps you through, mm -hmm. even because it, it feels as though that's something you do automatically almost. But the, with the detail of what you're describing as well in terms of your interest in history, technical details, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine maybe this is kind of a question that maybe gets in the way sometimes if you're looking to break outside in this film in particular? Yeah, maybe. Um, I mean, I always, I've always had a kind of soft spot for artwork that's been, you know, made in the 60s and 70s, that, like rule-based art, where you kind of like, a, you have a kind of set of parameters for something, and then those things become the kind of, um, the kind of framework for something. And for better or worse, I think that's how I, I work on things and how I approach them. Yeah. So maybe the, maybe the part that made this film difficult for me was that the, the rules that I had or all the preconceptions I had or I thought that, that I thought were going to work, they didn't actually work. Mm -hmm. So I ended up, up having to make rules, new rules, when I didn't want to make new rules. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah, so. But I see those guys all the time. So this film is like, oh my God, somebody made a film about these guys I passed every Yeah, day. I get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny because what Jessica was saying that um, people think that you're a surveyor when you're out. The oh. land surveyors are always confused for people on film crews, yeah, for filmmakers. So people ask them, what film are you making? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Since I have the microphone, I'll, I'll go next. Um, I think there's something interesting. I'm not sure what word you use to describe the art of surveying. Like you said, it was very precise, but also Like the, I guess I'm thinking of the, the business of map making as one that is one that involves a lot of historical rules mm -hmm. as well that is sort of like folded into the way we do things within our own uh, way we order things like as a, as a city. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's interesting to clash that with like a creative practice and, and hearing what you folks are saying about um, using, using things in ways they're not supposed to be used. It's, it's very interesting because, and then what you were saying about like some sort of like larger metaphor, it's I think interesting because as artists we're constantly working within a framework. Mm -hmm. We have to decide how much of that is a formula and how much of that we're gonna make our own and change. Mm -hmm. um, and questioning our assumptions within a certain medium and beyond that. And so I think that um, it's nice to see that addressed. And then to have that sort of like fold into sort of some sort of practice that's related, lens-based mm -hmm. related, like a surveying is a, is a practice where we make maps. Right. I enjoy that as a metaphor too, as a map making of your own artistic process and a map making of the city we live in. And, and right how those both can become formulas that can be like remapped almost. But uh, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't, is that a question? Not no, really. but I just, just a comment. Uh, yeah. maybe a comment, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Well, this, is, this is a really simple question. First, thanks for doing this, this was awesome. Uh, you you seem to hint quite a few times about pain yeah. in making this film and yeah. emphasize that. Yet, I, I as far as I know, you immediately jump into making a new film uh -huh. after this. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, is there something that you learned 
never to do again when you s started this new film and uh, or is it or you you really i mean attractively you you enjoyed that pain <laughs> <laughs> so can, can you just just maybe yeah give us a little bit of about that decision to immediately start working on this new thing yeah um i'm trying to think of the order of things i i think that i'm well there's a couple of answers. One of them is that the 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 nature of this kind of filmmaking in particular, but all really all f filmmaking, um, if it involves um, using equipment that is of a sp specific grade, um, you kind of you have to you have to build a lot of planning into it. So um, there's a kind of necessity to keep a bunch of projects in the air at the same time because they all have different production schedules and. Um, so you can't you can't really not jump into something because it's probably was planned like 18 months ago and regardless of how you're feeling about it you know so that's that's kind of one answer the other one is maybe that there was something about the difficulty that actually really did appeal to me um, while I was working on it um, that's probably better answered by my shrink <laughs> um, but uh, I think that yeah I mean it's a fine line between um, like self-flagellation and a challenge you know like where it is and and of course no one sets up to put put themselves in harm's way in that in that way like to, to to make something that is so impossible that you you really start like questioning your own sanity in a way and then you know the question of like, well, what's a good what's a good challenge for me, or what's something that is interested interesting to me, and and if something interests you, what happens if you hit a point where suddenly it becomes really not fun anymore? Like, like you start questioning like what what actually where is my role in this? As as like what what is my agency in this project? Is it is it to finish it? Do I have some kind of responsibility to it? And I think that's the way I end up feeling with a lot of projects is is there's always points when they bottom out and then they come back up again and they you know there's always these cycles and things where i think this is the most retarded idea ever i don't know why i'm doing this and then other times i'll be thinking like i'm a genius how come no one thought of this before or whatever you know like <laughs> like yeah it, it's 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 a pendulum it goes back and forth all the time yeah <laughs> Hi, already. Um, thank you very sure. much. Uh, it was really, really interesting hearing about um, the the film project, the exhibition project, and also the making of both. And it was really interesting to hear and see how you structured the book, how you chose to structure the book. I was wondering if you could speak briefly to the making of the book and what, what that process was like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should pass it around. Uh, um, Do you mean like the actual physical making of it, or just like how it came to be, or like? It, it, it does be interesting to do, do you know just end up making one copy, or is it actually can you buy the book? Or? Right. Yeah. So um, actually, Thomas's at uh, Thomas's recommendation, he told me about this place in Montreal called Quadruscan, which um, um, they're sort of the printer that they have uh, is sort of somewhere between offset and photocopy, like it's. Well, you can see the book, it's like amazing quality, but it's basically a photocopy. Um, but they do, you know, perfect binding and stuff. So it just means that you, you it's, it's basically like blurb, only it's in Montreal and you don't have to, you know, do it over the internet and all that kind of stuff. So um, not having a huge budget for a publication, but knowing that I wanted it to have a lot of information, um, I decided to um, go for um, thickness over um, quant quantity. <laughs> so I only printed 12, actually. And I also, um, I also knew that I wanted it to act as a kind of manual, so that, because it would, like, literally accompany each of the viewing stations in the exhibition, so there was, like, the little desk that we had made so that you could kind of consult it and maybe look at, you know, or read about things as you were looking at things in the exhibition. So, um, uh, so that's, that's kind of how it ended up being that way. I did it um, almost all the photography in the book is by me, except for a few 
At the Beginning and End by uh, Simon Bellieu. Bel Bellieu? Yeah. Bellot, yeah, Bellot, um, who was taking photographs for me on one of the shoots. But um, uh, And I worked with, um, I had a lot of help in scanning a lot of the documents. And, um, and then I also worked with a, a designer who, I kind of set the template and then she kind of, we worked back and forth to kind of massage the layout and the feel of things. But start to finish, it was like a little under three and a half weeks for the whole thing. It happened really fast. Yeah. Yeah. I was really tired. <laughs> I kind of like was thinking that it was just going to be a little guidebook and then it just kind of kept going and going and I realized like no I'm doing it I might as well make it like the way I wanted to make it and and I also thought the more I got into it the more I thought well it'll just it'll it, maybe somebody might be interested in publishing it so it will make a kind of good dummy as, as, as it were like I can like show it to someone who might potentially be be interested in it it's easier to show them a thing as opposed to like a pdf that you have to scroll through but um, so yeah, it's uh, one of 12, so be careful with it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so in fact, it was so close to the wire that I had to leave to go to Texas. And um, as you saw in the photograph, Rebecca was there too, but her flight was three days later. So she, um, the, 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 she had to bring the books with her to Texas. And then at the, <laughs> then, so I was, it was like very stressful, of course, you can imagine, like trying to do proofs and stuff over, over like the phone and like, yeah, I wish she doesn't want to come. And then, so Rebecca comes and she walks into the gallery in Texas, like hands me this book. I like rip open the package, I open it up and they printed the cover on the inside as well as the outside. <laughs> So they reprinted, they had to do another thing. So I actually have 24, 12 with the wrong cover and 12 with the right <laughs> cover. So anyway, that was stressful, but fun. yeah, yeah. Between the, um, uh, making maps and like as a way to understand as your artwork, but also your, uh, your practice as a filmmaker, do you think that this could be done the other way around like as like almost as the student as a uh, in mapping could use words from what you did like a film and make a book about and understand more his practice and like as as you receive comments of, of the students that mm -hmm. like told you oh yeah the, the way you you did the film helped me understand more the the practice i have of making maps and yeah sure that sounds like a great idea Go for it. <laughs> but um, I mean, I think the thing that I wanted to, uh, that I was hoping when it comes to you with the presentation too is like, I think there's a kind of fluidity in, in production for me and I think in for, for a lot of people too that we have these ideas about, oh, well, this is a body of work and you, you know, there's, maybe there's a vernissage and there's like a, there's a publication done or something and so you can kind of draw these boundaries around something but the reality is, the longer you make work, the realize how much more interconnected things are than you realize while you're making them. You know, like that 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 ideas that in that you think are maybe completely independent of each other. Once you get far, far enough back from them, you start to see that you know that they're really quite close. It's like looking at a galaxy through a telescope. You know, that I this summer I was in um, Marfa and um, they have. Outside Marfa, there's a there's an observatory there with amazing telescopes that are not electronic ones, but they're they're analog, and uh, you can look through them at night. And one of the ones that I looked through was uh, was pointed at this thing called um, uh, Messi Messier uh, 14, like the 14th uh, galaxy that was discovered by Messier in the 1700s, and it's just this like little cluster of dots. It looks like like um like a dust ball or something. And each of the tiny little clusters of dots is actually a sun, and they're all billions of miles away from each other, like light years. So it's like that kind of idea that, like, even if something is really far apart from each other, the further back you get from it, the closer they get, actually. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, thanks. Sure.